Thank you. It's very good to see everybody here this morning. As we kind of get back to a little bit more normalcy, it seems, every week, uh, a few more people, um, familiar faces. We're so grateful to see each and every one of you. We find ourselves again this morning in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. So if you turn there with me, we're going to uh, read verses 1 through 3. And our focus this morning is going to be uh, on verse 3. So if you would follow along with me as we read, and then we'll ask the Lord to bless this time. Beginning in verse 1, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This ends the reading. Let's uh, ask the Lord. Father, I'm so grateful that we have this opportunity this morning to come together and to look into your word. And I ask you this morning, Father, to help us do what I can't do. Uh, Father, I pray for your spirit to be our teacher and our guide. I pray for all of the saints here and those who aren't with us today. I pray, Father, uh, that you would strengthen them and encourage them by your spirit and through your word. Uh, we do pray for those, Father, that can't be here today. Uh, we know why, and, and uh, we just pray for an end to, to all, this, um, all this difficulty um, that is keeping us apart. Uh, we pray, Father, that what we do here this morning would be honoring to you. Uh, I pray that uh, you would guard my lips, uh, open clogged ears this day, and give us all sight. Help us, Father, to draw near to you through your word. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The Christian life is for nobodies. It's for the downtrodden. It's for the burdened. The Christian life is for the meek and the weak. But the Christian life is not for cowards. The Christian life takes courage and strength. Courage to stand on the truth when the world is pushing the lie. Courage to patiently wait on the Lord when everything about our situation says he's forsaken us. Courage to stand up against opposition and persecution knowing that all the powers of Satan and hell are behind it. It takes courage and strength, strength to resist temptation when giving in seems so easy. Strength to trust in God's promises when doubting comes so naturally. And strength to hold fast to our confession when physically and mentally and spiritually we become so tired. The Christian life is like a long distance race. It's like a marathon. It takes courage and strength each and every day. And in a word, the Christian life takes endurance. The struggles of the Christian life are many. We know this. Primarily, we have the ongoing battle with sin to deal with. And then we're faced with the constant barrage of sin from without us, from the world all around us. And then there's that open, and host, uh, that open and blatant hostility that the world has against God and Christ, and, and it's hurled at all of his people. The struggle is real, and the author, author of Hebrews knows this. God knows this. He knows the struggle is real, and over time, it can take a toll on us. It can wear down our resolve and cause us to grow weary physically, mentally, and even spiritually. Chapter 12 and verse 1 is the exhortation, the call to run with endurance the race that is set before us. God has ordained our race. And the key to running it well starts with getting rid of everything that hinders your progress, 
to take off all that slows you down. He says, laying aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles us. There's so much in this life that can trip us up, isn't there? So many distractions, so many responsibilities, cares and concerns, even the good things in life can be distracting. So many things vying for our attention. It's easy to lose sight of what we're actually doing here, what our purpose is, what our goal is. When things are going well in our life, we tend to want to kind of slow down, enjoy the good times, make them last a little longer. But there's a danger in that. Our, our sense of urgency can begin to diminish. Attitudes like complacency and apathy can creep in. You remember Christ said that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven? I think that's because the rich man is comfortable. He has a life of ease. He doesn't see any great need. But when things aren't going well, there's obvious danger there as well. We want to hurry up and get through those times. We want to we want to return to the good times or, or make it to the good times either way. Uh, our attitude is we need to fix the situation. We need to get out of what we're enduring. And when it seems out of our control, when these struggles and these trials of life are just heaped upon us and there's nothing we can do about it, we tend to cry out, woe is me. Where is God? Why am I having to go through this? The good times can tend to make us focus on the temporal, on the here and the now. The bad times can tend to make us focus on ourselves and on our situation. I want us to begin this morning by looking at what the preacher in Ecclesiastes has to say about this. Turn to Ecclesiastes, if you will. Fourth wisdom book of the five wisdom books, you've got Job and Psalms and Proverbs and then Ecclesiastes. You know, after Jim taught through this uh, several months ago or a couple years ago, this became, if not my most favorite Old Testament book. It's a close second. In verse 7, I'm sorry, chapter 7, verse 13, he says, Consider the work of God, for who is able to straighten what he has bent? Consider the work of God. Now, what does it mean for something to be bent? When we think of something being bent, it doesn't sound like it's right. It, it sounds like something bad. But who bent it? He says, consider the work of God, who can straighten what he has bent. So if he bent it, why would we want to straighten it? Well, I think it's because it doesn't fit into our idea of how things should be, right? Right? And, and when we look at the next verse, verse 14, we see that he's talking about the days of our lives, not the soap opera. We know that's bent. Amen. He says, in the day of prosperity, be happy. But in the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other, so that man may not discover anything that will be after him. In other words, as we go through this life, as we run the, the, the race set before us, we have a choice. We can look at things from our perspective or his. <clears throat> from our perspective, the days of adversity look pretty bent, pretty crooked. But when we change our focus, the way we think about it, when we change from the, the here and the now in ourselves and we consider the work of God in our lives, we see that God has made the one as well as the other. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whether things look straight or crooked, easy or difficult, good times or bad, we must always evaluate our situation in the terms of God's sovereignty. He's in charge. He ordains our path. He sets the course. And this is what the author of Hebrews wants us to do this morning as well. Back in chapter 12, he wants us to change our thinking. If today you are suffering, and that suffering is wearing you down, and you're being tempted to grow weary, or perhaps you're already there, 
or perhaps you know somebody who's there. The Holy Spirit, through this writer, wants to help. And it includes an exhortation for personal discipline. He says we must make the choice to lay down those things that hinder us. And like the preacher in Ecclesiastes says, we must change our focus from ourselves to our Savior, Jesus. He is our premier example, our forerunner, who has gone before us. He's run the race before. He leads the way. <clears throat> Excuse me. And remember, the primary exhortation here in Chapter 12 is, uh, verses 1 and 2 is, let us run the race with endurance. And the manner in which we do that is by laying aside all encumbrances <clears throat> and the sin which so easily entangles us and fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And then in verse 3, he says, for, and that links us directly with what he just said. Because Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith, for that reason, he says, consider him. Consider is a, is a, it's a mathematical term, an accounting term. Uh, it means to calculate or to think out carefully. A.W. Pink writes that it's signifying to compute by comparing things together in their due proportions. It means form a just and accurate estimation, end quote. The word is analogizomai, and you can hear in that word uh, something of our word analog, uh, a, a comparative person or thing. When you have an analog substance, they're comparative. When you are suffering, when you are under the weight of persecution, God's Spirit says to you, look away from yourself and your situation and look unto Jesus and weigh your experience, reckon it, calculate it with his. He just got through back in chapter 11, giving us this long list of many biographies of the Old Testament, right? Those who make up this great cloud of witnesses. <clears throat> Their lives of faith testify to us how to run the Christian life, how to run the, the race that is our, our Christian life. And what a gift it is, really, to have their testimonies, isn't it? Absolutely. It's wonderful to have these examples because we learn best by example, I think. These examples that, by which we can be encouraged, but ultimately the one that we are to look to is not Abel or Enoch or Noah or Abraham or Moses or any of the others, but it's to Jesus. We can look to their examples, but where was their gaze fixed? They were looking ahead. They were fixed ahead to the promises, and of that is, of course, Jesus, and that's exactly where I our eyes are to be fixed as well. And so we look away from ourselves and our situation and we look to Jesus, carefully reflecting on his example. He says, fix your eyes on him and because he's the author and perfecter of your faith, when you're endeavoring to run the race, the race of faith, there's no one better to meditate on than the one who ran the race before us, the one who perfected it consider him. Compare how he ran, how he endured with how we are to run and what we are going through. Now, I admit, I used to think, yeah, but Jesus is God. I mean, how hard could it really have been for him? He can endure anything. He's God, right? Well, in case you're thinking that, I want to remind you of Philippians chapter 2. It talks about Christ Jesus, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be held on to, but he emptied himself, right? He let go of that. He emptied himself and, and took on the form of a bondservant being made in the likeness of man. In other words, he was fully man, fully man. He felt pain. He felt sorrow. He felt grief and affliction and hardship. And this is why, in verse 2, the author of Hebrews uses the name Jesus to fix your eyes on Jesus. Whenever Scripture uses the name Jesus instead of Lord or Christ or the Son of God, it's an emphasis on his humanity. He was a man. 
He too ran the race as a man, didn't he? Absolutely. Hebrews 5 says he learned obedience through his suffering. Chapter 4 says that, that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. He knows what it's life to, like to suffer in this life. And his trials, his suffering, it was to a far greater degree than you or I will ever experience. When we're tempted... When we're tested and tried, if the temptation does not end or we escape from it, we're eventually going to give in. That's why 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is so important to remember that, that God is faithful, that he will not allow us to be tempted beyond that which we are able, but with that temptation, he will also provide a way of escape so that we will be able to endure it. God will never allow our trials to reach the level of testing that Christ's did. We look to him as our perfect example because he endured it to the extreme, and he did it as a man. In the military, there's something called SEER training. It stands for survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. And it's all about when you're stuck behind enemy lines and you're all on your own, you've got to learn how to survive, you've got to evade the enemy, and when you get caught, you've got to resist their torture, and you've got to escape. And I didn't go through this training, but I knew men who did. And one thing they teach, uh, in, specifically in the uh, resistance part of the training, is that everyone breaks. It's not like Hollywood portrays it, where people can go endure torture for, for you know, days on end. Everyone has their breaking point. If the torture doesn't stop or if you don't die from it, you're eventually going to tell them what, you want, what they want to hear, even if it's not true. In fact, I just read a story yesterday about an Iranian pro athlete who was a falsely accused of murder, and they hanged him because they forced a confession out of him. And there's a big international uproar over that. Jesus never broke. He never gave in. And he endured temptation to the most extreme levels, and he did it as a man. So great was his suffering that in Matthew 26, on the night before the crucifixion, there in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing the weight of the sin that he would take upon himself, that he would drink to the dregs the cup of God's wrath for our sin, he prayed, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. I believe that's an expression of his humanity. The fact that he knew the suffering he would have to endure, but he didn't succumb to that fear and anxiety that we certainly would have. For he immediately added to that prayer, yet not my will, but your will. So if you were like I used to be, don't think that his struggle was easy because he's God. He had some supernatural power to endure it. He took on human flesh and he experienced this life and his sufferings fully as a man. The author of Hebrews says, consider him. You know, to be a disciple of Christ, which is what we all claim to be, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I, I'm sure we all are disciples of Christ. I hope we all are. He... Uh, to be a, a disciple of Christ is to be a learner. That's what disciple means, right? It means to be a learner. We're to learn from him. He is our example in every way, in how he lived, in how he treated other people, in how he responded to the world, how he trusted God in all things, how he prayed in everything. He's to be our example. And how he suffered is also to be our example. We're to look to him as the author and perfecter of our faith and learn how he endured from his perfect example. These Christians to whom this was written, they were suffering. Their race was rough. They were suffering persecution, and the author of Hebrews knows that, and he doesn't discount it. He doesn't give them a bunch of platitudes and, you know, doesn't send them a postcard with the cat hanging on the edge saying, hang in there, you know, and, and it'll all get better, and you can do it. You know, he doesn't do that. Although I, I do believe this is a motivational speech that he's giving them but he gives them practical advice to help them endure their suffering. He says, consider him, who he is. 
Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, Lord of glory, the creator of heaven and earth, the beloved of the Father, the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, was ridiculed and reproached publicly. He was called illegitimate. He was called a liar. He was called a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors tax collectors and sinners. He was arrested and tried unjustly, beaten, scourged, humiliated, spit upon, had his hairs plucked out, actually ripped out. He was stripped naked and nailed to a cross. The creator of heaven and earth who while hanging on that cross, upholding the entire universe by the word of his power, the author of Hebrews says in verse 3 of chapter 1, at the same time being mocked by men and women, he created. He humbled himself all the way to the cross and he did this as a man. Isaiah 53 says he was despised and forsaken of men, smitten of God and afflicted, pierced through for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The chastening and scourging that we all deserve fell upon him. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb to slaughter, like a sheep to its shearers. He did not open his mouth. How did he respond to all of this suffering? Peter gives us a word on that. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. He says in verse 21, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. How did Jesus respond to suffering? He kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. Simply put, no matter how hard the road looked rode ahead, looked to Jesus. He was going to keep on running, wasn't he? Because he knew that God ordained it and that God judges righteously. He could trust him. So how did he respond? He responded in faithful obedience, keeping his eyes fixed on the goal. Consider Jesus, the author of Hebrews says. It's a simple, simple point but it's so vital in our endurance. Consider Jesus who endured such hostility by sinners against himself, he says. By saying such hostilities, most of the commentators agree that that he's underscoring the severity and the depth of the hostility. He's already mentioned the cross back in verse two. By saying he endured such hostility, he's including all of the open and active opposition that Christ encountered in his life. The author intends for these Hebrew Christians to compare how Jesus responded to his suffering with how they are to respond. They are to compare all of the hostility and suffering in Jesus's life to what they were experiencing. And we know that they were experiencing a lot of opposition and suffering. And he talks about that in chapter 10. He says they were were ridiculed and reproached publicly. They had their property seized. Some of them were even jailed for their profession. He called their experience a great conflict of sufferings. And now he says Jesus endured such hostility by sinners against himself. So consider his example. Consider how he endured in order to help you run the race of endurance. In the beginning, these Christians were running well, but now they're beginning to waver. They're beginning to show signs of weakness. I don't know if any of you have ever run a marathon. I'm sure you've heard of the expression hitting a wall, 
right? This is a very real event that, that marathon runners encounter. It's the point in the race. It's usually somewhere around 20 miles, and there's a, there's a physiological reason for that. It has to do with your glycosine levels or something like that. So the sugar levels in your body collapse somewhere around there. But it's the point when the runner experiences such physical exhaustion that, that breathing becomes labored. Every muscle in your body begins to burn like it's on fire. Your pace slows dramatically, and it's everything you can do to just take one more step. And what happens is because the body begins to scream out in pain, the mind begins to fail. The runner's will starts to falter. And when the will is gone, it's almost impossible to keep going. So runners learn to push through this wall. They do this by training their minds on how to think about it. They, they learn to look away from the pain and keep their eyes fixed on the goal. It's that simple. And that's exactly what the author of Hebrews is describing. That's what happened to these Christians, spiritually speaking. The ongoing suffering and per persecution that they were enduring for what was most likely years has left them weary, and now they need this warning and this encouragement lest they fall away. They are in need of endurance, he says. They must push through that wall, all, and the way that they do this is by changing their focus, changing how they think about the pain, how they think about their suffering, so that they won't throw in the towel. The Holy Spirit tells them through this writer to look to Jesus as the motivation and the encouragement to endure. I ask you, dear Christians, can you empathize? Do you know what it's like to hit the wall, spiritually speaking? And perhaps you're feeling that way today. You're feeling the weight of suffering upon your spirit. I don't think any of us here have experienced or are experiencing the level of persecution that these Christians or many Christians throughout history have endured. I don't think we experience anything close to what they've gone through th through their trials. But the trials of life have a way of working out the same result, don't they? The Holy Spirit wrote this to encourage specifically Christians who were enduring suffering from persecution. But I am confident that the exhortations and the encouragements apply to us today as well. We here in America, we, we, we may not know the level of persecution that they knew, but I have no doubt that one day the true church in America will, and it might be sooner than we think, let us not be lulled into complacency because we've been enjoying peace in this land for so long. But let us always remember that the call to follow Christ is the call to pick up your cross. It's the call to suffer and die. All we have to do is look around at the course of our culture and really of the world, and we can see. It doesn't take much of a stretch of the imagination to see the seeds of persecution of Christ's church being sown right here and right now, and that fruit will come forth so although we may not be under the weight of this level of persecution, we can prepare ourselves for what very well may come. And we can apply the same principles of endurance to the suffering that we experience today. And I know we experience suffering. Look, when you're suffering, you're suffering, right? Whether by persecution or simply the results of living in a fallen world illness and loss and sorrow and grief, struggles, or the struggle with indwelling sin. These are all things that wear us down. When you're suffering, you need encouragement. You need courage and strength to help you endure. And that's what this text is for. And the way to find the courage and strength to endure is by fixing your gaze upon the Lord Jesus Christ himself, setting your mind on him, learning from him, he says, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So that you will not grow weary 
and lose heart. This is in the Greek. It's called a henna clause. It's, a, it's, it's simply a, a, a purpose clause. The reason we're to do this is in order that we do not grow weary and lose heart. The expression in the Greek so that you will not lose, uh, grow weary and lose heart, it's an athletic metaphor. And it's used specifically to describe the runner who collapses from exhaustion, the runner who fails to push through the wall. This is exactly what he's talking about. To grow weary is a Greek idiom. It means to become tired in your spirit, in your will, and in your body. To lose heart means to lose one's motivation, to give up. Weariness is dangerous. It tempts us to give up. And you could say that this is medicine for the weary Christian, for the one who has grown tired in his spirit and is ready to give up. We all have taken medicine, I'm sure. Various ailments, I'm sure many of us took some pills this morning, right? Some of us took a handful. You can go to the doctor and you, he can give you a prescription and you can go fill that prescription and bring it home and you can study that prescription and you can, you can trust in that prescription and you can learn all about it and, and, and believe it's even good for you. But it knows no good if it just sits in the bottle, does it? No, you gotta take it in, right? We gotta take it in, just like antibiotics. You can't take half of it, you gotta take it all, right? You can't fill your gas tank up halfway and expect to get all the way to your destination. I know I'm mixing metaphors, I apologize. Well, these Christians are very, are, are, are in a very real sense, they're ill. They've grown weary in their struggle. And the author of Hebrews says, here's your medicine. It's Christ. The remedy for weariness, it's not a pill. It's not a list of, re of rituals. It's not a list of, of rules to follow. It really boils down to changing the way you think. Change the way you think about your, 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 your suffering. Change your focus. Have you ever considered that the Christian life is primarily worked out in the mind? I mean, don't get me wrong, emotions play a role. Our actions certainly play a role. But it's our thinking that dominates the Christian life. What we think of God, what we think of Jesus Christ and his spirit and his word and all the things of God, that's what matters first. A.W. Tozer, in his classic work, The Knowledge of the Holy, says what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And he goes on to say the same thing about the church. After that, I suppose what we think about ourselves, who we are, we're sinners in need of grace, what we're to be about, what our responsibilities are, what we think of others, what we think of the world, what we think of sin, what we think of the future, what we think of everything. How we perceive those things matter. What we think about them counts. The Christian life is a life spent in constant renewal of the mind, of how we think and how we see things. It's a contemplation of doctrine. It's a consideration of Christ. It's a life of self-evaluation and so on. So just like the runner who hits the wall, our endurance depends on how we think. Focus on yourself, you're going to constantly fall down. Focus on your pain, you're going to constantly be weary. Focus, focus on your situation, and you're going to constantly be discontented and dissatisfied, because nothing down here satisfies. We live in a fallen world. This isn't our home. This isn't where we belong. But fix your eyes on Jesus. Think only of him. Change the tape that plays in your mind all day long. From me, me, me to him, him, him. Right? And you will not grow weary and lose heart, he says. You will find the strength and the courage to endure. You'll break through the wall and you'll reach the finish line. It's a wonderful word of, of encouragement to us. And what does that look like? I mean, practically speaking, what does it look like? It's daily devotion to his word. It's daily devotion to prayer. It's commitment to the fellowship of the church. These are the means of grace that God has given us. 
by which we are fed, we are corrected, we are encouraged, we are strengthened, by which we endure. The word of God is, is the power of God unto salvation, both to save us and to keep us saved. And let me be quick to add that it's not just a list of things to do. There must be a personal relationship. One rooted in love for the Father, led by His Spirit. If you, you don't have to turn there, but in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul prays that God would grant to the Ephesians by the riches of His glory. And I'm reading from verse 16 to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up with all the fullness of God. Knowledge and action is vital but without love, what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 13? Without love, it's useless. We must have a personal relationship. It's a devotion to these things, but it's a devotion to Christ. The Christian life takes courage. It takes strength to endure to the end. It's not for cowards. It's promised to be tough, in fact. 2 Peter 1.3, Peter says, But God has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and ex excellence. In closing, I want us to turn to Joshua chapter 1. For decades, the people of God here in Joshua chapter 1 for decades, they've been waiting. They've had decades to think about those so-called giants who live in the land that they're supposed to head into. For decades, they've had to struggle and toil to survive in the desert. For decades, they've been anticipating and waiting. You can imagine the anticipation and the anxiety of it. And here they are now. Moses is gone, the one who led them out of Egypt, the one who spoke to God for them, their, their faithful leader has died. And the time has come for Joshua and the Israelites to go into that land, to enter the promised land. And you can imagine the fury of activity that there must have been, the, the tension and the sense of, of urgency that they must have had as they prepared themselves not only to move the whole entire nation into the land to cross that river, but they're going into battle. They're entering the fight. They're stepping over the line, so to speak. And God says to Joshua, beginning in verse 2, he says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise. This is chapter 1, if I didn't say so. I'm sorry. He says in verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. <clears throat> now, therefore, arise. Cross this Jordan, this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them to the sons of Israel. Every place on, I'm sorry, every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and as far as the great sea toward the settling of the sun will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you, he says. I will, not I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night that you sh so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you, God says? Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. 
Now turn to Matthew chapter 28. The disciples have been in a wilderness of sorts. Christ is dead. All hope seems lost. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt has set in. And many of them are growing weary. But then behold, he is risen. And much joy is restored as they worship him. And before our risen Lord sends them forth into the battle, he gives his great commission to his disciples here at the end of verse 28, or the end of chapter 28. He says in verse 18, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. He is our author and perfecter of faith. He's our forerunner. He's our God. And he will not forsake us in this battle. He says, just look to me. May we be renewed in spirit and in mind this morning, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful again for your word. I pray this morning, Lord, that if there's anyone in our midst or perhaps listening who is on the brink of giving up, weary, the battle has worn them down. I pray, Father, that you would strengthen their inner man, that you would lift their eyes up to your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us all to do this, Lord. Help us to trust you each and every day, all the more. Grow our love for you, our knowledge of you. And help us, Father, to draw near in all times, good or bad. For, Father, that is truly our desire. We seek to be in your presence. Thank you, Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for the promise that you've given to us to keep us. Help us to utilize all that you've given us to endure so that we might run well and that we might hear with Paul at the end of our life, well done, good and faithful servant. In your son's name, we give you praise and all honor and glory. Amen. There is just a couple minutes.